Uh, welcome uh, to the program overview. My name is Dr. Jamie Van Gumpel. I am the program director for the Mayo Clinic uh, Rochester Neurosurgical Program. I'd uh, like to uh, thank you for looking at this video uh, and it's gonna detail what I believe is the premier and the uh, top uh, neurosurgical training uh, program in the country. And I hope uh, uh, we can interest you in taking a look at us as I, I believe we train the best surgeons in the world. This is an overview of the Mayo Clinic Residency Program. You know, I, I love this quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, it's probably more relevant today than most days, is that the function of education is to teach one to think intensively <clears throat> and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of education. Mayo Clinic has deep-seated values that I believe not only teach appropriate patient management in a, an environment in which you're not pressured by monetary incentives to, to um, do more cases or do uh, more additional parts of the case. But what is most interesting, about, I believe, about our, and interesting and unique about our institution is how character, morals, and ethics are built throughout the program. Um, and I believe when people leave here, they make sound patient decisions and, and enhance uh, the communities in which they go to based on that character and spiritual training that people um, more or less receive here in addition to uh, what I believe is the premier surgical education in the country. We meet uh, yearly uh, with our staff and uh, go over our goals in which, what are we trying to accomplish as an institution? And our first aim is to train the best technical and clinical surgeons. And, and the undertow to this is we want people to leave our institution that um, would operate on our parents or our kids. And um, that's what we ask ourselves all the time uh, with our daily tasks. Are we, are, are we getting there with each resident? And our second aim is to train neurosurgical leaders. Uh, you notice that neither of the aims say that this is, uh, our goal is to train academic surgeons. We recognize that about 50% of our residents will go into private practice and still make substantial um, contributions to uh, their communities and their hospitals by learning some of the, the leadership traits that we have here and bringing those and proliferating those to other uh, smaller institutions. Um, we believe that uh, Mayo is one of the best places in the world to learn those things. And this, uh, if, if anybody has seen this, MESQ, um, uh, before this is from the uh, Barcelona football team, my son's a big fan of Messi, in which they say they're more than just a soccer team. Well, I believe we're more than a residency based on some of the additional things that no other program can, can offer like ours across the country. You know, we're a very diverse, um, um, uh, ethnically, uh, uh, um, gender and, and, and regionally uh, program you know, obviously we don't draw most of our residents from Rochester, Minnesota. Most of the staff are from across the country. And this is just a smattering of the residents that have, uh, where they've come from in the time that I've uh, been program director here. We have, uh, we have multiple countries uh, of origin for several residents, including Italy, uh, um, Great Britain, Greece, Israel, Jamaica, Mexico, and uh, Brazil, and also, You'll notice in particular that um, despite this being a, North, uh, a Midwestern program, there is uh, a fair amount of people that uh, have come and, and, and been successful within our program that come from the coast or the south. Um, and I think that's one of the more unique characteristics about our program is it's very, it's very well represented across the world and, and across uh, the country. Mayo is further unique in that, um, you know, we're one college with five schools with multiple sites um, across the country uh, to, to kind of bridge that um, geographic diversity. Uh, there were the largest graduate medical training program in, in the world uh, with over 1,700 uh, um, active trainees across 275 programs. We were established in 1915. And uh, residents most of the time within our program spend uh, the majority of their uh, uh, training career in Rochester. However, residents, uh, for instance, go down to Phoenix Children's Hospital uh, and learn uh, pediatric trauma down in, um, uh, in Phoenix and may spend time in Jacksonville with, a, with a, a surgeon down there that they believe they can gain extra 
um, expertise from. We see 1.3 million patients from all 50 uh, US states. And, and uh, depending on the year, I've seen 150 countries to 136 countries on this particular slide. Um, and because of this excellent infrastructure, we offer a lot more that other institutions can't because of the large training uh, environment that we have. Um, as I stated earlier, there's a lot of character built in our program based on how the Mayo brothers and some of their subsidiaries um, brought ethics into the practice. Uh, and this is bridged out further if, if anybody has time to watch the Ken Burns special about Mayo Clinic. Um, you'll understand a little bit more about the depth of which people believe in this institution. And William J. Mayo said the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. And in order, in, in order that the sick may have benefit of the advanced, advancing knowledge, a union of forces is necessary. Um, you know, the needs of the patient come first is the, is the primary Mayo Clinic um, value. And uh, I believe that's really critical to learn that early on in residency. And also, I, th I think most people really truly appreciate that when they leave our institution understanding that. So in that same vein, we are looking for compassionate, driven individuals with a genuine desire to move our field forward so that they may better treat the sick and keep people healthy. We are looking for future leaders in their, in their fields, uh, which may often overlap with different academic interests. There are strong team players who are autonomous in pursuit of excellence, someone who thrives both on freedom to pursue his or her interests while remaining a member of the team. And our institution is a unique in that there is a lot of early autonomy in the operating theater, uh, which I think is very attractive. Unfortunately, a lot of people weren't able to rotate this year and see that, but um, uh, it is a very unique environment in that respect. So how do we train? Well, we have a unique model in the mentorship model. Despite uh, having now over 20 staff, we maintain a one-to-one -one or one-to-two or one-to-three training relationship with our staff. So um, what that means is, PGY2s typically spend a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the chief resident for nine months in their second year, um, uh, learning their, their, uh, what they've learned through the program and develop a unique relationship, which we, allow, we, be, we believe allows people to fly more in the operative theater because trust is gained earlier. And then in your third and fourth years, you spend uh, uh, rotations in vascular where you may work with Dr. Lanzino and Dr. Uh, Savistano, or you may work with myself and Dr. Meyer doing cranial surgery, but we spend time getting to know you and we believe that that mentorship model allows us to push you faster, quicker, to be better, and allows us to really pay attention to the details that we need to do to get you to be a good surgeon. Um, I believe this model is excellent in a lot of ways, but by the conclusion of your fourth year, I truly believe we, we, we could graduate individuals here that would meet those criteria that I stated earlier that you know, would operate on family members or myself. Um, and what we typically use the, the fifth, sixth, and seventh year for is seasoning and directed learning for based on what your career interests have developed into. Um, uh, we are a four per year uh, program, which started approximately three years ago. This will be the fourth year we're matching four, uh, four per year into the program. In your PGY one year, there's typically six months on clinical neurosurgical services. Uh, five months of that is uh, spent on the chief service, uh, learning about trauma patients and, and acute hospital consults. One month I'm with myself and Dr. Meyer um, uh, to kind of get a different patient population, uh, mostly cranial surgery. The remainder with critical care, endovascular procedures, spine procedures, anesthesia, and surgical ICU. Um, at that time, uh, within the first 12 months, all non-neurosurgical requirements are met that the ABNS has set forth for us. In the PGY2 year, nine months are spent on the junior uh, residents, uh, as a junior resident of the chief service typically. Um, sometimes people spend six months on staff services, um, but uh, commonly in that PGY2 year, people will do a functional rotation and oftentimes a PEDS rotation. In the third and fourth year rotations, we bounce around between uh, strictly spine, uh, with, which would be deformity, general practice spine, and, um, and, uh, and minimally invasive spine, in addition to neuro oncology spine. And you may spend uh, you know, two to three months with myself or Dr. Link doing skull base or epilepsy um, uh, and cerebral vascular. We do, uh, we do have a formal rotation in endovascular as well that's accomplished during that time. So, um, in different procedure specialties. 
And we'll go over a little bit about what the fifth and sixth year uh, and seventh years look like and how those pathways can, uh, can be adjusted later. Um, that's kind of the unique aspect of our uh, program is that how much flexibility we have within that time. And this is a, a, a basic layout for, you know, generic resident um, that you can kind of pause the screen here and kind of look at what that looks like over time. Uh, and we'll explain a little bit better up uh, over the next couple of coming slides here. But as I stated, you know, we look at things as, you know, there's not a lot of flexibility in the fourth year. By the end of the fourth year, you're typically taken and passed your boards. Uh, we have a, a proud tradition of passing at high level here. Um, and you're more or less malleable to be able to develop uh, what your career plans are and try to target your job. Um, I'll show some slides later, but we have a PhD track. So currently we have a PGY-8 who spent three years within his residency completing a PhD and did so successfully defending his thesis just a couple of months ago. And we've done that in the past, but we've now have formal tracks available for people that are interested in pursuing that pathway. There's also a well-developed uh, um, through the large uh, Mayo Clinic um, Graduate Medical School clinical research tract, which, which you can gain a master's or a certificate in performing either clinical trials or uh, patient outcome-based research, and they teach you how to do that. And then there's a you know, clinical track. So not everybody wants to get additional training and they may choose to spend more time on services, uh, picking up things like uh, you know, complex spine. Some people do that. Um, and we do uh, have a track within our institution to get to gold certi uh, certification for, for through the Equality Academy. We do require that our residents get bronze certification at the very least, which is quite easy to do. Most people graduate with silver certification, which is something that people can take with them to their new institutions and be involved in quality um, uh, there. Uh, and then in people that embed their research years in the two research years they will they will have in their seventh year a, a, a formal chief year so a full year of of getting back into the practice and we'll go over how how autonomous that is later but in some patients or sorry some uh, um, residents if they choose to do a fellowship we do move their chief year up into their sixth year um, and then they complete a fellowship later on and we'll show you what some of those look like so example of things that, that most recently have been done with our, uh, our trainees in their fifth and sixth year, we had a, uh, a, one of our um, residents who just recently graduated last year uh, go to Israel for a year and uh, get a, a, specific, a specific master's in disaster management, which she was very passionate about. Uh, we have a resident currently in their second year at the, Sp at the Stanford Biodesign Fellowship in, uh, in California. And, um, and uh, we're allowed to have that kind of flexibility uh, uh, because again, we're, we're covering one hospital. We've uh, um, had a PhD completed by Dr. Ben Himes in immunology. And soon uh, we have another uh, resident who looks to be entering into biostatistics. Uh, Dr. Brown has uh, completed a T32 NIH training award. He has a previous um, a PhD and expanded his research under that uh, mechanism. Uh, there's bench research, NRF grants. I know, Doctor, um, we've had two uh, NRF grant funded researchers in the last two years. We're quite proud of those uh, residents for accomplishing that. The Clinical Investigators Training Program, Outcomes Research, and also Clinical Trial Investigations. And some people choose to just do rotations away, and we, we typically support that if provided they're in good standing. So we had a resident spend six months at UPMC learning additional trauma, and some people go to Phoenix Children's. We've had people uh, spend a specific time with certain individuals, like Ali Christ uh, down in Arkansas. And uh, we uh, like that type of a flexibility. In fact, we encourage our residents to try to spend some time elsewhere, uh, you know, getting a different perspective, whether it's in Mayo, Jacksonville, or Scottsdale, or elsewhere. And again, these are those current examples. So, Dr. McC so Dr. Brown on the on the um, on the left, uh, he had a pre-existing PhD uh, obtained from Rutgers prior to coming here. He did an enfolded neuro-oncology fellowship with Dr. Parney and Dr. Burns. He did, his, uh, he did a, a, a rotation uh, both in Jacksonville and also in France with Hugh Defoe. Uh, now is, did uh, lab work last year under a T32 training award and now is a chief uh, looking at academic positions. Dr. Graffio is currently in an infolded fellowship with myself and Dr. Link doing uh, skull base. He completed a, a master's in public health and biostatistics and uh, did a chief in his sixth year. Um, Dr. Ben Himes, who's currently a PGY8, 
completed an in-residency fellowship in, uh, or sorry, a PhD in immunology, and again, successfully defended his thesis recently, and is currently a chief looking at academic practices in neuro-oncology. Um, Dr. McCutcheon uh, his, uh, is currently uh, on Stanford's campus uh, completing a second year of a Stanford Biodesign Fellowship because he's interested in device innovation. And he'll come back next year and complete his chief year. Now in this year, he's also coming back frequently um, um, to get back in the operating room and do calls so he doesn't lose his skills. So we, we have some ways to facilitate those types of things. Uh, but realistically, our, our, the pinnacle of our residency is something that was very common back in the days. We continued to uh, uh, support and now a lot of programs are trying to get back to doing this, but a, a true chief year, which we believe is again the pinnacle of our residency where the chief resident is, runs the service independently with a mix of cases from inpatient and outpatient consult, consultations and trauma. Um, you have an in, in, independent clinic with a nurse that helps you get through and handle the patient calls, uh, scheduling team, and all the necessary ancillary staff, and I have PAs that help you on the hospital service. They accept all inpatient consultations at, at uh, uh, St. Mary's and Rochester Methodist Hospital. The elective cases are staffed with, at, uh, at the chief's discretion with the staff that they feel appropriate or comfortable staffing with, or maybe they want to learn a technique that they hadn't learned through residency, or they want to try something new. That's oftentimes how that works. Uh, for uh, uh, pretty simple things, uh, you know, the staff will supervise the work, uh, meaning that they'll come in and check it and make sure it's appropriate. But for more complicated things, oftentimes the staff is still um, engaged in the case with them. Uh, the uh, chief service is autonomous, um, and uh, they have a junior resident as well, as we talked about, usually typically PGY2, so there's unique relationship and mentorship there. And the end result is that, uh, that they, you kind of run your own practice. You kind of get used to you know, doing things the way you want to do it and testing. And, and by the time you get out into independent practice, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward for you. It takes a lot of the anxiety out. It's more or less a transitional year. Uh, and this is just uh, one of our chiefs from last year. And on a day that she was given all the rooms, this was around Christmas, so a lot of staff wrote, but she was given all the rooms, so she was pretty psyched. And this is Kevin, uh, the, uh, the, the, the male nurse that works with the chiefs. And, and honestly, these, uh, these um, other people uh, participate a lot in education and teaching you what's normal. How do we, you know, what is a, is a, is a wound okay at three months and, and, you know, those types of things and how do you follow the spine fracture? So there's a lot of education built in from a lot of ancillary staff at the Mayo Clinic. Um, you know, the caseload, we typically start between eight and 13 cases. In fact, uh, just yesterday we, we started 15 rooms. Um, this, we're in the post COVID-19 uh, spike of cases. So we're, we're trying to catch up currently. Um, almost all of those are done at St. Mary's, although uh, Gonda does have some outpatient experiences and, and some of the fetal myelomangocele repairs and, uh, and some of the cases that our peripheral nerve colleague, uh, Dr. Spinner does uh, occur at um, Rochester Methodist, but most of it's run at St. Mary's Hospital. We do over 5,000 surgeries a year um, and uh, growing every year. There's uh, inpatient endovascular and SRS procedures. We have a gamma knife unit. We have a proton beam unit. Um, between the hospitals, there's 2,059 beds uh, on the Mayo Clinic campus. Uh, there's 148 beds that are part of the uh, Eugene Alito uh, Pediatric Hospital. There's 67 ORs at St. Mary's. There's an additional 40 at, um, at uh, Rochester Methodist. Uh, there's two dedicated neuroendovascular suites within our institution. We have the largest ICU collection in the United States and within one institution, so 200 ICU beds and 200 step-down ICU beds. Um, our outpatient procedures are done at St. Mary's, but also Gonda. And uh, again, I get the fetal myelo repairs are done at uh, Rochester Methodist. This is uh, St. Mary's Hospital. It's our, our uh, crown jewel. Um, during uh, our formal residency interview process, our, our residents are planning on giving you some virtual tour tours in real time so you guys can ask some questions about the hospital. But the hospital is one of the largest hospitals in the United States and uh, can be intimidating, but uh, people tend to learn it quickly because we spend most of our time on nine Mary Bride, eight Mary Bride in the, ice, uh, in the uh, ORs. So uh, it gets to get, uh, we get well known quickly. Uh, it has level one trauma certification. If you look around, there's a lot of institutions uh, at the top 10 list that, that don't have so, that, those types of things. Um, you know, for the last several years, it's been the number one hospital in the United States. Uh, by the U.S. News and Reports. Of course, you know, I, I believe anyone in the top 10 is, is, uh, uh, is excellent. 
Um, and uh, we rank nationally as the best specialty in 15 adult specialties and eight child specialties. So the, the point is, is that the hospital has a breadth of excellent physicians within it. So, um, you know, patients get excellent care if there's anything funny that happens uh, in, in post-op. And this is our Mayo Clinic campus. So this is a blown up map of Rochester. And what you'll notice is our clinic building is about a half a, half a mile. So on a, on a walking day, it's, it's, point, it's seven tenths of a mile away from St. Mary's Hospital. Residents spend most of the time here. There's a bus that runs on 2nd Street that goes back and forth all times of the year. That takes about five minutes to get between the two. On a nice uh, summer day like today, I walked it. Uh, I walk it all the time and it's really nice walk. Um, and then Rochester Methodist Hospital is actually attached to the Gonda building. So this is the Gonda building. Rochester Methodist, our proton beam facility is attached to this called the Jacobson building and St. Mary's is over here at a separate campus. Um, the St. Mary's uh, has, uh, has uh, helicopter support and, and uh, also plane support. Um, so, but most of the residents and staff live outside the downtown area. Uh, but the point is the campus is, has, uh, um, it's, uh, it's pretty condensed. Uh, the call structure for our program, you know, day, day call during the week is covered by a team of PAs as there's the residents are responsible to be in the operating room. On night, there's uh, one junior resident in-house who's first call and one senior resident in the PGY-5 to seventh years who's the on-call chief. They process the junior call and call the staff about what the plan would be. Uh, weekends, there's one PGY-2 covering the chief services. There's uh, two PGY-3 or fours in-house. Typically that works out to being uh, one weekend a month on call. Um, and if you're doing the math with four residents per year covering one hospital, you know, the, the call frequency in the evenings is, is, uh, is um, you know, once every two weeks. And then there's uh, one PGY-5 to seven on weekend uh, chief call. So the, the chiefs and the, and the actual on chiefs take about 50% of the call and the rest of the call gets offloaded to the off-service residents. In the uh, in PGY one year for the first uh, several months, there's a buddy call system where you're kind of on call the first month uh, with a four, and follow them around. And then uh, after that, um, you uh, you are on call with the four, but you're kind of responsible, and they're in house if you need them. And then after three months, uh, we cut the umbilical cord, and you're on your own. But it's a nice uh, soft way to introduce people to call, and I think it takes a lot of the anxiety out of it. Um, and as you see below, I didn't prepare this slide, my residents did, but uh, you, the in-house night calls Q attended to 14 and the uh, chief calls between seven and 14. This is our typical uh, morning uh, 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 weekly conference. We do education every day uh, from seven to eight prior to the ORs opening. Um, and uh, currently we do this in Zoom. So it's, it's actually worked out quite well. But, you know, so Mondays is our more or less grand rounds day and we do a chief resident or a led discussion when we have our staff meeting. There's a research grand rounds. Uh, there's usually a visiting professor. Uh, morbidity mortality occurs then and then we oftentimes have a guest speaker on the fifth uh, week. Uh, Tuesdays are clinical, uh, clinical cranial conferences in which we have Dr. Meyer typically presents cases or myself or some of the other cranial staff. Uh, an ABS type style and then cerebral vascular conference occurs during that day. And then I do an administrative conference in which we meet monthly and try to see how we can improve the residency as we go. Uh, we uh, uh, further uh, have uh, a spine day on Wednesdays uh, in which, uh, you know, um, we'll do case conferences like we do a cranial, but it'll be ABS style. There'll be a one le uh, uh, lecture, a didactic lecture a month. There'll be a journal club and uh, oral board case review type uh, days. Um, on Thursdays, it's kind of a smattering of things. So we have a pediatric journal club, a didactic lecture, lecture a resident talk. So we, get, we have residents give at least one talk per year to get uh, on something they find interesting. And uh, we do a cranial journal club. And then uh, on the fifth, Thursday of every year or every um, that's available. Uh, Dr. Spinner or the chair gives a talks with the residents uh, independently. Then on Friday, we have a neuro oncology work conference for other conferences that uh, go on during the week for those that are interested, like skull based conferences uh, that myself and Dr. Link participate in, a neuromodulation conference, epilepsy conferences, and so forth. And um, 
So the highlights are that the case volumes of residents from an average of 1,069 cases per graduating residence 10 years ago to an average of 1632 cases per most recent graduates of our program. The total resident publications have uh, risen from 19 publications uh, in an academic year and 10 years ago to last year being 120 publications. So a logarithmic growth in publications. And I suspect in the COVID-19 year, we'll have, uh, this will probably be tripled. The, the numbers are quite astounding given the short-term shutdown and additional time uh, residents have had on their hands. Uh, we have infolded fellowships in spine, skull base, uh, um, cortical tumor surgery, so brain mapping and insular gliomas, uh, which is neuro-oncology. We have a peripheral nerve uh, infolded and exfolded fellowship. We have a neurocritical care fellowship. And people have spent focused time with myself doing epilepsy. Uh, some people have done functional or gamma knife uh, um, uh, focuses, maybe six to 12 months uh, spending with each one of those. We have other educational opportunities, such as a skull-based lab over at Nine Stabile. Uh, we have uh, introductive courses in open and endoscopic skull base that occur every year uh, that are only for residents and designed uh, uh, to go over uh, approaches that we believe are critical. We do also peripheral nerve dissections uh, uh, prior to oral boards and spine instrumentation courses in the evenings designed to um, uh, enhance the, the learning curve with those particular procedures. We have paid course participation in Woods Hole, AO Spine boot camps, um, uh, as well as, uh, as uh, one available trip to um, something that you just wanna go to. And sometimes people use those for um, the more expensive courses. The three month away rotations, and we have a large, month of, a large number of visiting professors, although obviously right now they're virtual. Uh, we're excited because uh, at St. Mary's Hospital, the uh, institution um, is building a large uh, facility called the Mastery Facility, which is Mayo Advanced Skills Training Education Resource Yard. Uh, this will occur right next to where the cafeteria is, uh, which will be a 24-7 open uh, facility uh, seven days a week. So if you're on call, it's two o'clock in the morning and you are a second year and you think you have to suture better, you can go down to this facility and there'll be suture there for you to practice on a, on a pig's foot or something like that. And if you're more advanced and you want to learn how to do a posterior petrosectomy and those types of things, uh, you can go down there and practice this on your own time uh, without limitation. And we thought that was very critical. The concept behind this is not the nice fancy labs that we have uh, for courses. It's more of a you know workman type a work workman or woman type mentality where we're going to get down there when we can and and uh, continue to learn the best we can all the time. And uh, I think it's gonna be an amazing resource um, uh, for us to have. And this is somewhat what it's going to look like. This, this right down here is the microscopic stations. These are endoscopic trainers. There's gonna be um, you know, a live uh, uh, endovascular and, uh, and, um, and uh, fluoroscopic suites and, and those types of things and an additional space for, for, for discussions and, and uh, teaching. Our uh, educational philosophy is uh, see one, do one, teach one. Um, we, uh, we do uh, tend to attract residents that, are, that, are, that really do wanna get hands-on earlier. We provide a structured didactic learning environment to do this. There's a, there's a lot of individualized learning given the mentorship model that we have, and we have high expectations and, and demand higher performance in our institution uh, early, to be quite honest with you. Um, we demand technical mastery and, uh, and you know, we give you progressive responsibilities over time and we do adhere strictly to the milestones, but I will tell you that most residents achieve milestone four by the time they're in their fourth year. What else can I tell you? Well, no other program with the mix of, of a smaller city and a huge patient volume exists in the world that makes life very convenient. It's easy to get in and out of the hospital if it's five o'clock at night and you wanna go home and have dinner with your family, well then you go. Uh, it's not like you have to wait for the, the traffic to die down and go hit the bar and get a drink before you go home because it's a waste of time to sit in your car. You know, we subsidize the residents heavily, um, meaning that they get an additional uh, amount of money based uh, more so than the government allows, uh, or sorry, the government provides. So, you know, in a, in a general residency, so my course over the time of residency, I think I estimated I made an additional $15,000 in addition to what um, I would have been paid, which would the uh, government subsidy would be. We, uh, we provide free food uh, to the residents still based on call schedule. We provide parking. 
Uh, we have a book fund uh, available that most people are using online resources because who really buys books anymore, but we still have it available. We have loops funds, we uh, offer courses obviously, and we send people to courses. There's social activities, you know, Dr. Meyer has a pool party yearly. Um, we have Friday outings often where we uh, go out and catch some drinks. Not, not, not necessarily in COVID-19, but plan to get those back. Um, and we, did, we had been participating in uh, softball in our own city. So this year we still uh, played a league, uh, but we did not go to New York City because obviously the, the Colombian softball tournament is, was shut down. Um, regardless, uh, we plan on, on continuing to expand social acti activities and we incentivize residents to do so and pay for often uh, most of these activities. You know, the, the perks and resident wellness here, I think are quite um, uh, excellent as well. You know, we offer 15 uh, days per academic year of uh, vacation and um, um, that excludes holidays, uh, weekends and trips. The, um, that number may be going up uh, in, in this next year. We get 10 days uh, for trips, uh, provided you present an abstract or or have a poster, and there's stipend for conference registration, poster creation, illustration. Uh, there's also additional stipends for travel, lodging, food, and, uh, and local transportation. For new moms and dads, there's maternity leave, um, um, six week maternity plus six week FMLA. So most, uh, so um, we've had several residents have uh, uh, kids, uh, several kids within <laughs> residency, and I believe we have a very supportive environment to do that. And the, um, there's a lot of uh, family friendly. Um, uh, perks with our program. Uh, paternity leave is still five days at our institution, although that uh, probably will change over time. Uh, we have two APCs and an EAC, so we have excellent education support, and we have a uh, workout facility, which you see down here within the hospital, uh, in addition to a Peloton bike, uh, which we purchased and put within the resident's uh, wor um, work area so that they can do Peloton workouts when they're on call or if they're not busy that day waiting around. So um, we're, we're heavily invested in wellness and, and those, uh, those types of initiatives as well. There's a lot of family things to do in Rochester and uh, you know, they don't have to be family. They can be with uh, by yourself too, but there's, you know, a nice nature center that uh, you know, lots of hiking trails and, and really cool historical things there in caves. Uh, and in the winter time, that becomes a uh, cross-country ski area that uh, that's that's a, just a blast. I really enjoy going out there. The uh, Oxbow Park and Zolman Zoo are are here, which is free. And if you have young children, you know I I think you can talk to anybody with that's a parent within the program. They'll tell you that they probably spend every weekend out at this place because they have a petting zoo and and uh, really neat animals, and the kids just love it. And it's it's super easy. It's uh, it's only ten minutes away. The Douglas State Trail, there's a lot of biking trails. I love the bike. A lot of the residents like the bike, and, and, and it's pretty awesome uh, to just be able to get out of town in, in, in less than five minutes and, and be able to bike. Uh, I, I bike every Saturday about 30 miles to and back uh, to Douglas uh, that I can, at least in the summertime and the, in the fall. Uh, there's some historical sites like Mayowood Mansion in town. There's the Minnesota Children's Museum, Monkey Junction Playground, Bounce World, you know, climbing and, and fitness things, soccer, uh, uh, volleyball leagues uh, associated with bars around here, kickball leagues, there's lots of stuff to do. You know, our, our team works hard and they like to play hard. And, uh, and um, I uh, think that's kind of the point of our residency is uh, we're mostly an elective practice and that, uh, you know, most of the work is concentrated between the hours of 7 a.m. to uh, 5 p.m. and there's evenings to still explore interests and advocations. You know, um, I think it's important not just to live life in your vocation. Uh, as professionals, I think we kind of get sucked into that. But I'm a huge believer that, you know, eventually we're going to move on from this job and, and we want to be able to be developed outside of work too and, um, and uh, not be too one-dimensional. We have uh, holiday parties uh, pre-COVID, of course. I don't think we'll have one this year, but perhaps uh, back to next year after vaccinations. And it's a pretty fun event, um, you know, visiting dinners, uh, although again, these have been suspended this year, but I hope to get these back shortly. And, uh, you know, loop programs, like you'd expect the softball thing, you know, we provide coffee, candy, games, all the stuff down in our education office, where down at St. Mary's, at, um, just to enhance uh, interaction with our EPCs. And you know what, so what, when we get down to it, it makes us unique. I mean, we're a resident first program, which I believe gives us happy residents, superior ability to prepare residents to be excellent surgeons, one-on-one -on -one faculty availability, involvement in teaching, 
a wide depth and breadth of, of, of faculty cover all aspects of neurosurgery, a wide and diverse variety of patients and clinical resources. You can find economic, uh, sorry, geographic economic diversity also uh, by visiting a different campus. And then there's a the beer bus, you know, there's lots of breweries up here in Minneapolis down in Iowa that we sometimes uh, enjoy and, and have a good time hanging out. And, uh, and, and just as a final note, I wanted to touch upon, so how has COVID-19 impact As I kind of mentioned as we went through the talk a little bit, you know, these things, you know, it's, it slowed our practice down for a month, but interestingly, because we're so isolated as a small institution with a high number of ICU beds, I don't think we'll ever get the, you know, the same problems that the big cities have, like, I, like, like we saw in New York City. And in fact, what we've seen is a big rebound in patients coming here because they, they, they know it's an isolated institution. Um, and we just don't have high numbers of COVID-19 yet. I don't expect that a, a city of 125,000 will get there. And I think we'll continue to be a safe environment. And I think that'll continue to enhance our practice. Now our group, all our group learning has moved to Zoom. I think it's been awesome for the residents because, you know, I think it's forced us to be innovative in education and, and it's uh, using tech resources that uh, I don't think we would have been able to do earlier. And I think it's been, created even more convenience and more learning. Um, and our cadaver experiences still happen. They're just smaller groups. They're not groups of 20, they're five. And, and uh, so be it. It's more one-on-one -on -one teaching, which is what we're all about. And, um, you know, uh, we're, uh, we're not being resourced out to other uh, parts of our institution to fight COVID-19. And, and the residents are being able to concentrate on, on academic and scholarly pursuits and also learning how to be a neurosurgeon, which I think is important. Um, in the end, I thank you for your time. I hope you consider us. I do strongly believe this is the best institution in the world to train. Um, you can uh, reach out to me by email if you'd like, uh, but I look forward to talking to you this year and good luck in the match.